Hi, I'm Dan Sullivan, the President and CEO of the Grand River Dam Authority. The GRDA was created in 1935 by the Oklahoma Legislature as a conservation and reclamation district for the waters of the Grand River. The Grand River that comes to the Pensacola Dam behind me forms now what's called the Grand Lake of the Cherokees. That watershed extends well up into Kansas, Arkansas, and Missouri. About a third of our watershed goes into the state of Kansas, and the overall watershed is somewhere around 12,000 square miles. What this program, Guard the Grand, is all about is in cooperation with the Environmental Protection Agency and other partners, we've received a grant that will help you understand the importance of what we all do as an impact on our water quality and the ecosystems that surround Grand Lake. One of the things that, that we really have been trying to accomplish through this program and other educational opportunities is letting people know that when you live in the watershed, what you do in your yard, in your home, and all around you has an impact on a greater area far beyond where you live. And that 12,000 square mile area culminates in water that comes all the way to the Pensacola Dam behind me. That is what we're trying to do, to make sure that people understand that you can do something that impacts water quality and the systems all around you for generations to come. We thank you for being interested in this Guard the Grand program, and we look forward to you joining us as a guardian of the Grand. Thank you. The following is a pre-recorded workshop on the Adopt-A-Shoreline program and about boat and dock maintenance. We hope you learn a little something about how you can help guard the grant. Hello, everybody. So my name is Scott Horton, and I have uh, worked for GRDA since 2015. And coming to work here, uh, we noticed that there was a problem on the uh, shorelines in the uh, in the realm of a lot of white styrofoam and trash that had built up over the years. So Ed Ferguson and myself, we went up to uh, Lake of the Ozarks in Missouri and uh, looked at their program that they'd had uh, running for quite some time and came back to Grand Lake and incorporated a large group of stakeholders, businessmen, dock builders, et cetera, and came up with the Adopt the Shoreline program. It's a, a volunteer program um, GRDA pays for all of the disposal cost of materials in the form of uh, dumpsters, roll-off dumpsters, trash bags, and we do also supply some labor uh, in that objective as well. So the mission essentially was just to provide a leadership role with the stakeholders on Grand Lake, uh, just to remove litter and debris from the shoreline. And uh, it's uh, twofold really, it safeguards the ecosystem and enhances the quality of life for the stakeholders. So as the shorelines look cleaner, property values increase, uh, we hope to see more uh, visitors to Grand Lake. And uh, the objectives we wanted to do is solicit businesses and organizations and individuals for shoreline adoption, uh, coordinate an annual cleanup effort, uh, recognize our volunteers for their dedication and commitment to the program, and coordinate efforts with other organizations on Grand Lake having similar objectives. And those organizations would be uh, Guard the Grand would be one, as well as the uh, Grand Lake Cell and Power Squadron. Uh, and we wanted to foster an atmosphere of ownership among the stakeholders and visitors uh, to make this program a success. You can go to the next slide, Jerry. We do have a full-time staff to assist with the cleanup. GRDA allowed me to uh, hire three uh, individuals and buy a lot of equipment uh, to aid in that, uh, that venture. We currently have 667 miles of shoreline uh, just on Grand Lake alone, and GRDA is also responsible for Hudson Lake, um, as well as the pumpback situation there on, uh, on Hudson. We divided Grand Lake into 10 zones to make it more manageable. And each zone has a coordinator um, for those zones who kind of act as the uh, point of contact for the volunteers. So the, the coordinator, what they will do is they will organize a cleanup date after they speak with their volunteers and businesses within their 
respective zones, and then they will contact me. We will set up dumpster locations and uh, get the crew out there to assist them. Uh, we currently have two coordinator positions available uh, that are vacant. Zone 10, which you'll look at the top of the map, uh, that runs from the Elk River up to Wyandotte. It's a really sparsely populated area, uh, and there's just not a lot of residents to participate in the program. Uh, so our crew primarily handles uh, that zone. Uh, and we have zone two just came open. One of my original uh, coordinators um, uh, is getting a little bit older and wanted to step back from the program and we're currently looking for someone in zone two. Uh, that zone runs from the uh, Pensacola Dam over to Drowning Creek. Uh, so if you know anybody in zone two that might be willing just to uh, act in a volunteer capacity, and it's really not a lot of physical labor, it's just uh, coordination and management needs is what we uh, have with those coordinators. Next slide. Uh, since the inception of the program, and we started uh, picking up debris in 2018, the early part of 2018, we've removed over 200 tons of, uh, of white styrofoam and trash uh, from the shorelines in those two years. Uh, we hold one organized event each year. Uh, this year, we had to take a step back due to COVID-19. I think everybody understands that. But uh, we just did not want to put a lot of our volunteers, and a lot of them are a little bit older, uh, including myself and uh, some of our, uh, our workers. So uh, GRDA has really uh, clamped down on employees interacting with um, folks in the field with trying to keep uh, you know safe distance, et cetera. So we have really postponed everything for this year as far as cleanup activities. Uh, we plan in the fall to try to fill those remaining two uh, coordinator positions and then kind of recharge and step forward for 2021, hoping to have a, a cleanup activity in uh, April or May of 2021 lakewide. Uh, we do supply trash bags to the residents. Uh, it's got our logo on it, and uh, we encourage uh, the zones to organize additional pickup events. Uh, we only really sanction one organized event per year, but if there is a specific need due to a high water event, uh, the coordinators can contact me and we will supply personnel uh, to that zone to help them uh, have an additional uh, cleanup deal to keep the shorelines clear. We do have a, a website on, uh, on our webpage for GRDA, uh, but we were really trying to uh, close that one down and go strictly to our, um, our Adopt the Shoreline Facebook page. So we will probably be suspending the uh, Adopt the Shoreline webpage in lieu of going to a uh, Adopt the Shoreline Facebook page. And the address on the Facebook page is just Adopt the Shoreline Dash Grand Lake. So we encourage everybody to get on Facebook, join us. That seems like the easiest um, media outlet uh, to organize and keep people informed. Next slide. Scott, we did have one question about what can we do with the white foam blocks that wash, wash up by the docks? Okay, so that is a part of the program. Uh, we are not doing any organized events, but if those people want to contact me, uh, let me give you my phone number at the office. It's area code 918-256-0894, or they can send me an email at uh, philip.horton at grda.com. Uh, then I will, when our crew becomes available, I will send them by and pick up those uh, foam blocks. And of course, we'll pay for the disposal, so. And are there any boats to assist or any way to assist with the really the steep shoreline cleanups? I'm sorry, try that again. When the shore is pretty, when the, you know, it's on a hillside or a really right. steep shoreline, is there some way to assist with helping get those cleaned up? Yeah, we do almost all of our cleanups by water. Uh, so I've got a, a work barge with a platform. It's got an auto crane on the front for heavy lifting. Uh, so our crew can take the boat into pretty tight uh, spaces. We've also got access to a Munson watercraft, which has kind of a drop down front gate. So we can pull up to the shoreline, drop the gate down and walk onto the shoreline and load material. So uh, 
you'll see our barge, it's on the left-hand side. We're currently contracting for a new barge, uh, much larger, uh, be have a lot more capabilities. We'll be able to load our skid steer and some other equipment on this new barge. And we hope to get that in service sometime next year. Great. Um, so anybody that has some styrofoam accumulated on their shore can contact you at any time for pickup? Yeah, they can uh, give me the information. It's helpful to have a dock number uh, that it's by, and I can track that on Google Earth imagery and then send that out to my uh, shoreline crew and uh, have them pick that up. Okay, any other quick questions? But we really would like to push, you know, once we open this back up after COVID settles down, uh, all we ask is just one day, and it's usually four to five hours work uh, in each zone. So uh, finding where you live on the zone maps, and then we can hook you up with a coordinator. All it requires is just a little bit of boat gas and sweat equity, um, and it really makes a difference the more people we have. So. Uh, we don't mind coming by and picking it up, but we're we're also really looking for volunteers to help us in this this endeavor. Great, thank you very much, Scott. And um, Scott's going to talk a little bit about dock maintenance um, after we talk about boat maintenance. So I'm going to take it back over. Uh, I think I finally unmuted myself and talk a little bit about mo boat maintenance uh, for water quality and invasive species. So when we think about the lake, right, we have a lot of different uses for it, recreation, we've got fishing, swimming, boating, jet skiing, tubing, sailing. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of times a lot of different vessels on the water, but that lake is a multi-purpose lake, right? So it's also used, can be used for irrigation. It can also be used, um, it's, it is used as a drinking water supply for some of the communities uh, around the lake. So what are some of the things that we need to think about when, when we're working on our boat? So your boat can have an impact through oil and grease, gas, um, trash. This is a picture down here from um, the floods last year uh, at the dam. I happened to be up there uh, and you can see a lot of trash still collected. Even though they've picked up 400,000 pounds of trash in two years, it still happens. So, um, you know, think about on your boat how you, um, how you store your trash and that kind of thing. Painting, sanding, and staining of your boat. Um, sewage waste, especially for the larger boats. I know there's some big boats on Grand Lake and maybe people um, go out there and live on them for the weekend or whatever. Um, how are they disposing of that sewage and are they doing it properly? And something else that we don't necessarily always think about with our boats is the turbulence and, and the wave action that happens along the shoreline. So that, um, that wave action can actually cause and increase some of the erosion along the shore. So this is an example of um, a video I took. I was not at Grand Lake, I was actually at Lake Murray. Um, but I, it was very busy, it was about two weeks ago. It was one of those 100 degree days or whatever. Um, my husband and I, and I went down there to kayak and fish and we stopped to swim for a while, kind of even in just a little cove. So there weren't a lot of boats going directly by us, but the wave action really intrigued me and I thought it was a good opportunity to actually show the impact of what it can have. So you can see, and this is, this is not made up, this is from boats, because when the boats stop going, things calm down. You can see um, from the, uh, just from the vegetation that was in the water, how rough it can be. And you can see a lot of debris starting to move up. It's pretty rocky there, so you didn't see a whole lot of erosion, but there is some sediment moving there. So it was just kind of a, I used it as a, you know, I was just kind of thinking, man, this is a really good example of the impact that those waves can have. And we don't necessarily always think about. Not that, you know, we're necessarily going to say you must slow your boat down, but it is something to be conscious of as you're boating, especially if you get near the shore, because the closer you are to the shore, then the impact, um, the big, bigger the impact is. And then when you clean your boat, um, don't use chemicals to clean your boat in the water. Um, wash your boat on land and ensure the water doesn't discharge into that water body. 
If you have to use soap, a lot of times you can just do it with water, but if you need to use soap, make sure that it's biodegradable and has no phosphates in it. Most soaps now are uh, not, they don't have phosphates in them, but that's something to double check because that can add actually nutrients and things into the waterway. And you might think, well, I'm just one boat. What difference does it make for me? But when you think about the number of boats on Grand Lake, it, it can add up. Um, and then preventing invasive species. Zebra mussels have been a huge issue um, in a lot of different lakes in Oklahoma. So you wanna make sure, and it's not even just the zebra mussels, that's just the one people know the most about, right? But there's also uh, vegetation and there are some algaes that can be carried into the waterways. So you wanna make sure that you inspect your boat for any vegetation or any other invasive organism. Make sure you drain your water because really it's not so much that you have a zebra mussel attached to your boat and that's what's um, being carried into the next lake, but it's the eggs in the water. And if you don't drain your boat, don't let it dry out completely before you go into another, a different lake, another waterway, then you can help spread those invasive species. Same way with the uh, vegetation just the seeds alone. So you wanna make sure that you clean your boat out before you um, uh, switch lakes. And again, make sure it's dry before you go into a new water body. Um, with your boat engine maintenance, you wanna pre-clean your engine with a wire brush because of that alone can um, reduce how many solvents that you need to use. Properly dispose of your hazardous waste, such as your oil, your oil filters, your batteries, whatever. I have some numbers on the back and we also have a brochure on hazardous waste and all of the contacts in the Grand Lake region for where you can dispose of your hazardous waste. Um, don't just dump it on the shoreline, don't dump it in the water. Um, use an identified non-toxic antifreeze instead of the highly toxic one. Usually it's a blue-green ethyl, uh, ethyl, ethylene glycol mix. Um, it is highly toxic. I, for years, um, worked in a vet clinic, and I can't tell you the number of dogs we saw that had accidentally licked up um, uh, antifreeze. It is not a pleasant way to go, and it's very sweet, so they really like it, but it's also toxic to the fish and the bugs that live in the water. So uh, we think about it when we think about our dogs, maybe, but we don't necessarily always think about it around water, and it can have the same effect in the water. Make sure you inspect your fuel lines for deterioration and replace when necessary. We don't want that gas getting in the water because again, it can have an impact on the life that lives there. Don't perform your engine maintenance, um, such as you're changing your oil or anything near the water and don't dispose of any uh, waste into the water. Um, this is an issue still, I don't know so much around the lakes, but um, uh, I mean, as recently as three years ago, I knew somebody who caught a neighbor dumping oil down their storm drain, which then ended up, it leads to a lake or river. And it really doesn't take much oil at all to cause issues. And then follow your boat's recommended uh, maintenance regime so that things are kept in good working order so you're not out in the middle of the lake, right, and have to get out that paddle. Um, and then just kind of be conscious of your surroundings and what you're doing um, around your lake. If you're gonna paint and sand your boat, um, perform it um, when it's out of the water. Don't be sanding your boat um, in the water because even that little bit of sand, uh, not sand, but the, you know, the, uh, the, the wood that you're sanding down or if it's fiberglass, whatever you're sanding can have an impact. Um, the wood's gonna deteriorate. If it's some kind of plastic, then uh, the bugs or the more likely the fish are gonna think that's food and eat it. Sometimes you have that issue with birds as well. So um, think about that. And then make sure you're using the proper type of paint. So you, there's uh, above water and below water paints. Um, generally the above water is oil-based and oil and water really don't mix. <laughs> so you don't wanna for sure do that on the lake, but uh, make sure that you, it's dry before you put it back in, that you clean up everything properly if you're using that oil-based paint. Uh, and don't do it near the water's edge. And then below the water, sometimes people will paint it just to help reduce algae growth. We don't have um, barnacles like you would have in a, in a marine environment, but you can get some slime and algae growth on the bottom of your boat. So there are some uh, water-based, and there's also some solvent-based um, uh, paints that you can put on the bottom of your boat to help 
reduce that algae growth if that's what you need to do. So there are times you can use uh, the top, the, the oil-based paint on the bottom, uh, but it's, um, it depends on how long you keep your boat in the water. If it's always in the water, then you may not want to use that oil-based soap or paint, I'm sorry. So think about for your boat you're painting and what you're going to be using to paint it with. Um, and then when you fuel your boat, make sure you're doing it properly. Uh, don't overfill your boat uh, because we don't want that discharging in the water. A lot of times we pull up to a marina, right, and we discharge it. Maybe you want to use um, an absorbent pad around the nozzle as you're filling it up. And I have a little video I'm going to show you that I found from Boat USA on how to properly fill your boat and why. And then any fuel or oil spill that causes a sheen or any visible globules has to be reported. So um, I know that was one of the questions in the quiz and a lot of people thought maybe it was like five gallons or maybe a gallon. It can be two drops. It doesn't have to be very much at all. So if it makes a sheen on the water, an oily sheen, or it starts clumping up or settles into the sediment, that is reportable and has to be cleaned up. So you can call the National Response Center. You can also call the Oklahoma Department of Environmental Quality's um, hotline, and I've provided the numbers here. Call your county um, local emergency uh, program. Also call GRDA Dispatch. GRDA actually has an environmental response trailer for large spills. They've had to clean some up in the past. Um, and then think about maybe getting a spill kit on your boat. Um, that's a good way if you spill a little bit of oil or a little bit of gas, just put one of those pads down. And, um, oh, <laughs> thank you, Scott. I see I left off the phone number. I got, apparently got interrupted. Um, 2560911 for the GRDA dispatch. Uh, but it's an easy way to just kind of soak that up. So it's easy to, relatively easy, if it's a small amount, to kind of soak it up and clean it up. Uh, but you do need to clean it up. And again, it, a drop or two. It doesn't take a gallon. It doesn't take five gallon. Almost anything that's spilled is reportable. And this is just a short video. Hopefully you can hear it. If you can't, let me know um, just about how to fill your... Boat. When talking to marina owners and managers, the fuel dock is top on their list of areas for a potential right? spill. Anytime you have a transfer of fuel or oil product, there is an increased risk of a spill. Whether you are the person holding the nozzle or you pass the nozzle off to the boater for fueling, as a marina employee, you will be seen as an expert. Boats fuel differently than cars for a couple of reasons. Unlike automobile fuel tanks, boats have vents that allow outside air into the fuel tank and permit fuel vapors to escape. Unfortunately, this can also allow fuel out of the tank. The vent is one of the primary places where spills occur during fueling. To help eliminate this threat, if possible, hold an absorbent pad or spill catchment device over the vent during fueling. Another challenge is that boat fuel gauges are often inaccurate. Boats can list and roll and fuel tanks can be irregularly shaped, making it challenging to get an accurate reading of how much fuel is needed. To help eliminate the possibility of an overfill, it is a good practice to ask the boat of the capacity of their fuel tanks and how much fuel they think they need. This will allow for a more controlled dispensing of fuel and avoid any sudden burps or vent discharges. Many marina fuel pumps also dispense fuel at a much faster rate than their roadside counterparts. This allows boats with large tanks to fuel more quickly. The downside of a faster flow rate is that as the tank fills up, it can be difficult to stop before fuel overflows at the deck fill or is discharged from the tank vent. To eliminate these spill threats, don't fill the boat all the way to capacity. Leave some room for the fuel to expand in the heat. Avoid using or disable the hands-free clip on the pump nozzle and always require customers to stay with the nozzle when fueling. Use an absorbent pad around the deck fill when fueling to catch any splashback. Listen carefully to the sound of the air coming out of the vent. The change in sound is one of the first signs that the tank is near full. Don't rely on the automatic shutoff. These are not always reliable. Instead, watch the gauge on the pump and be attentive when you know you are approaching a full tank. Um, I just thought that video was kind of interesting and helpful. Um, and again, the reason we don't want the fuel or the oil in the water is it can be toxic. And when we think about lakes, a lot of times what we think about are 
just the fish, right, that we see swimming in the lake or that we're trying to catch. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, what those fish eat. There's plankton, there's a lot of small macroinvertebrates that live in the water. So they can actually have, uh, the, the fuel can have a very negative impact on that. Not only is it um, just toxic to them, but if you coat their gills with the oil and that kind of thing, then they can't breathe. So I did include a little bit of what GRDA requires as far as equipment in the boat, just since we're talking about boats anyway, I thought it would be a good idea to throw it in there. Um, you're required to have a valid registration and certificate. Um, the registration decal needs to be three inches minimum in contrasting colors. You have to have personal flotation devices um, for each person. You need to have oars or a paddle in case that boat breaks down. You need to have an anchor, bailing device, fire extinguisher, uh, working navigation lights, horn, whistle, or bell. And all of this information can be found on uh, GRDA's uh, website. Also for the registration and cer certification, cer certification, the certificate, um, the Grand Lake uh, Boat Power Sa uh, Sail and Power Club um, has a vessel safety check program that's free. So you can check with them as well to get your uh, certification or uh, registration on your boat. Then GRDA ha does have some boating rules. So all the personal flotation devices or PDFs need to be in good working condition and available, immediately available to occupants. Um, whoever's operating the boat needs to be 16 years of age or older. If you want a child um, 12 to 16, year age, 16 years of age to operate the boat, then they need to complete a boater safety uh, education course. You need to have, make sure you have an ID, a state issued ID uh, on you when you win. All kid, when you're in the boat, all children 12 or under must wear an approved uh, PDF on vessels that are over 26 feet long. And when I say approved, it's Coast Guard approved. Um, it's unlawful to operate a boat while under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Uh, operators are not to carry more passengers than what the vessel is designed for by the manufacturer. Um, don't stand or ride on any part of the vessel that's not designed for passengers. Um, that includes a covered bow or, or a front deck, gunwale, or seat back while the vessel's moving. I know we do some teacher's workshops um, up there, and a couple of years ago we were uh, out um, taking the teachers out on the lake with some of the um, GRDA officers and a boat went by. It was pretty funny because it was like a pontoon boat with a top deck and you could see when they saw the police boat going by, everybody on the top, top deck immediately started getting down below because the, the boat was moving. So um, they know those rules, uh, but it's a good idea to uh, pay attention to or just kind of a reminder of what those rules are. Don't let folks in the boat stand their arm or leg over the end of, edge of the boat or below the railing while it's moving. It could cause somebody to get pulled in. And then alcoholic beverage of beer and wine are allowed, but distilled spirits are not uh, in public and that's per Oklahoma state law. So if you have any questions about any of that, um, I believe Ed Ferguson, uh, one of the GRDA police officers is on the call as well and he'll be able to answer any questions um, at the end on any of the uh, GRDA rules or anything like that. And then I'm happy to answer any questions about any of the boat maintenance. And now we're gonna go talk about uh, dock construction. I'm gonna let um, Scott take over again. All right, thank you, Jerry. There's always a lot of questions uh, about dock construction. So we have uh, a permitting process for private docks if you wish to download the application, you can go to grda.com. In the center of the page in red, you will see a, uh, a field called Lake Permits. Select that and then scroll down to Private Dock Application. In that dock application, there'll be a checklist of all the things you will need to submit with that, that app. And then we will send a uh, compliance officer such as myself, and we have several uh, working in that division. And they'll come out and take a look at uh, your proposal and uh, see if that dock construction can be approved or not. So, uh, but things to consider, it's always a money-driven, economic-driven decision uh, on what type of dock 
uh, you can afford, uh, how large. Uh, but there are some rules on the private dock application. You will see a, uh, a document that's attached. It's called the Safety and Construction Standards. And it essentially has the, uh, the main rules that we uh, require be followed uh, for installation of docks. Uh, also talks about dilapidated docks. So if you have an existing dock that has a lot of vegetation in the foam or uh, submerged uh, portions of the frame, uh, that it may be time to just go ahead and get that dock refloated. So uh, we do have a, uh, a permitted dock installers list on that web page as well. We only allow permitted dock installers that are on that list uh, to work on Grand Lake in, uh, in the construction and installing of docks. So there are many uh, materials that are used uh, such as composite decking. Uh, it's a little more expensive, but the maintenance is uh, far less than it would be with wood. Um, there's pressure treated lumber uh, and that resists rot. It's a little lower cost. Uh, it does require some maintenance periodically. And uh, those maintenance uh, to those pressure treated lumber decks, you know, can be harmful to aquatic organisms. So uh, I can get a list of, um, uh, requirements for cleaning your dock. I can get that to Jerry and she can post that as well. Um, aluminum, and that's really, uh, there's not many, there's not any aluminum docks to speak of, but uh, there's uh, docks that are galvanized material, which uh, just prolongs the life of the steel uh, substructure. Uh, it uh, guards against uh, rotten or decay. It's a little more lightweight than your conventional stick welded docks. Uh, can be powder coated or painted, uh, does get hot. Next slide. So when we talk about painting, uh, I want to touch base on that before we moved on, but we do not allow any spray painting of docks on uh, GRDA um, lakes. So uh, the overspray uh, tends to get in the water and it clumps up in the back of coves. It's also harmful to aquatic life and uh, vegetation. Uh, so if uh, any painting is going to take place, uh, it needs to be brushed or rollered. Uh, we do prefer that you have some type of catch mechanism under the dock or some plastic um, to catch any splatter that may go into the water. And uh, it's also very helpful to kind of boom off around your dock or the area you're painting. So if somebody should knock a paint can over and it spills into the water, it would be um, caught in that immediate area and not get outside that containment. Uh, so it'd be a little easier with like a, a fish dip net or pool dip net uh, to uh, collect some of that contamination and get it into a, an approved container. Uh, we do not allow uh, power sanding uh, docks. Uh, that causes the metal paint flakes to go off into the uh, the uh, the water. Uh, that includes uh, sandblasting, uh, and that's uh, the preferred method for a lot of people because it's just easier. But uh, we just don't allow sandblasting just because of the uh, water quality issues. So a shop vac is very handy uh, when you are uh, doing dock maintenance. That way you can immediately. Uh, take care of a spill or any uh, debris that comes from paint chips, et cetera. So uh, we would uh, just kind of yearly take a look at your dock and make sure all the boards are securely fastened. Uh, make sure that, um, you know, there's no rotten boards that you could step through. Uh, and that would include your walkway as well as the deck on the, uh, on the dock itself. Um, We've talked about the tarp underneath to catch the debris. Uh, check your cables and fasteners. Uh, a lot of docks don't have stiff arms. They have cables uh, attached to uh, anchor points on the shoreline. A GRDA does not allow uh, cables to be anchored to trees on our property. And it's just to uh, you know, keep the trees as healthy for as long as possible. So if we go out to do a transfer of ownership and we see uh, uh, cables to trees, we will deny that uh, transfer request until anchor points are installed and those cables are placed on those points. Um, we do require uh, electrical inspection. 
uh, on any transfer or new docs. Uh, so it's really just a good practice irregardless if you're building a new dock or having one installed or transferring ownership uh, just to periodically you know every couple of years um, have a licensed electrician just come out and take a look uh, because with all the storms we have and the wave action you know things get broken loose um, and it you know it's uh, electricity in the water like oil does not mix so uh, We've been lucky so far. Uh, I don't know of any drowning since I've been here as a result of electrical current, but we've certainly gotten calls of electrical current in the water and, uh, and had to have an electrician come out and rectify those problems. Next slide. So here's some uh, helpful information. If you have a question about lake permits, we have a wonderful lady in the, the permitting session. Anybody deal, dealt with or knows that? Her name is Janet Delasante. And uh, she can be reached at 782-4726. That's the main number. Um, uh, Janet can walk you right through the permitting process and does a lot of uh, a lot of that with folks that call in needing some doc questions answered. Uh, if she's not able to answer the questions, then you can get a hold of one of us uh, compliance officers. Uh, just ask for a, a compliance officer, and we'll give you a call back. And certainly. Uh, help you get through the dock permitting process. Uh, the GRDA police, there is the uh, web page for their uh, website. And uh, of course our direct number, like we've said before, is 918-256-0911. They're on duty 24 hours a day. If there is a eco issue, such as water contamination, fuel spill, et cetera, they'll send an officer out to take an initial report. Uh, then they'll contact one of us and we will get the containment uh, apparatuses and route to that location and uh, work to get that spill cleaned up. So, so this is all the uh, hazardous waste disposal areas that we identified in the region and their contact information. But if you do have some kind of hazardous material, old paint, old solvents, your oil, tires, whatever, these are some of the contacts. Again, if you go to our website or if you want me, me to, I can mail you a brochure that has all this information in it. I don't know how often they do it, but a lot of times the larger uh, communities will hold a yearly hazardous waste event where you can go once a year and take your hazardous waste there. Uh, but these are just some good uh, contacts for you if you do have some of that you need to get rid of. Thank you for watching our video on the Adopt a Shoreline program and about boat and dock maintenance. It's going to take all of us working together to improve the water quality in Lake Grand Lake and learning about the small steps that you can take can help make a big difference. Please join us for other workshops as well. We've had one on understanding your watershed, landscaping for water quality and conservation, and septic system maintenance. So check back here to see when those videos are also available. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at guardthegrand at grda.com. And we look forward to you becoming a guardian of the grand.